I am teaching on the new covenant gifts, and my plan is to cover all of them eventually. Right now, we're talking about the ministry gifts, specifically the ministry gift of the prophet. And our focus today, I've titled it, Pouring the Foundation. I see at least four levels of prophecy in the New Testament. Number one, people spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Number two, the spiritual gift of prophecy. Number three, the ministry gift of the prophet. And then number four is the four other ministry gifts. Now, I've labeled this first one foundational prophecy. That's just my label that I put on it. Because I believe this level is for every spirit-filled believer. In fact, if these things that we've heard so much about, the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, all those things related, if they were taught, truly taught, based on 1 Corinthians 14, then any person who speaks in tongues would be expecting to interpret those tongues that they speak and also expecting to prophesy. It is the absence of that expectation. It is the void of that anticipation of expecting to interpret and expecting to prophesy which lets me know these things have not been taught, for the most part are not being taught, based on what we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, for anyone that would be watching or listening that would not agree with me, I'm not considering only the first five verses of 1 Corinthians 14. It's just that I can't put all this in one sermon or even two, or in my case, even 40. So uh, uh, it, I, I like to be thorough. I really do. Uh, I like to be detailed. I, I don't want to leave things out. I, I grew up among a group of people that, well, they left out more than they said. And I don't like that. I like to know. I like to understand. But I'm advising anybody that, you know, you're thinking, well, really, is that true? That I, I speak in tongues, so should I expect to prophesy? Should I expect to interpret those tongues? Well, go back and study 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's really what I'm saying to you. Now, I spent hours, and I mean lots of hours, meditating on all of this. And I believe that the prophecy that is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, is the same as the gift of prophecy spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Now, you're listening, and that's good. I want you to, because I want you to think about what I'm saying to you. We have 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, where it talks about the gift of prophecy. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, those first five verses, Paul is telling the people in the church that speak in tongues, I wish you would prophesy. And I'm saying it's the same. Now, what at times may have appeared to be more than one kind of prophecy is the result of several things. It may be levels of spiritual maturity because levels of spiritual maturity can make you think, if you don't know better, that there's more than one kind of prophecy. 
the growth, the development, and the use of the gift can make a difference. The understanding of the Word of God in an individual can make a difference. The particular purpose for which a prophecy is given can make a difference. Now, these are some of the things that I used to identify these four levels of prophecy that I shared with you. What's the difference in there being different kinds of prophecy and there being four levels of prophecy? The difference is this. It's all the same prophecy. It's just the difference in these people. Think about that. It's the difference in where the people are, what the people are about, what's in those people, what they've been taught. That's the difference. It's all the same prophecy, but it's going to come forth at different levels. Now, I talked about this quite a bit before, and so I'm not going to belabor that. I think as I get deeper and deeper into this, it will all become a whole lot more clear. But, for example, the person who has only spoken in tongues, that person may not realize, may not know, may not even believe that they can prophesy. I'll put it this way. I prophesied before I believed I could. Some of you can relate to that. I prophesied before I believed I could. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I was as much as told I couldn't prophesy. What do you mean by that? Well, the group of people that I grew up around, they thought that there were only just a very tiny little hand-picked group of people that would ever be allowed to prophesy. And as you go through that list of nine gifts, depending on what they are, that number of people that God can use in that way shrinks in the, in the mind of a whole lot of people. So, so we've only got a few that can prophesy. We've only got a few that should ever give a tongue in the church. There's even fewer that should ever interpret. And my goodness, when it comes to working of miracles, there's only one guy left doing that. I mean, that's kind of the way it came across. And so, frankly, just being me, whenever the urge to prophesy came on me, I just did it. I received the Holy Ghost the same way. See, in the church that I grew up in, they thought you had to tarry. That's what they taught. And they thought you couldn't get the Holy Ghost till after midnight. I know that's what they thought because that's the way they talked. And it would have been better if instead of carpet, we'd had sawdust on the floor. Because you get sawdust and you get after midnight, you might get the Holy Ghost if you've been waiting 30 years. Now, that's the nonsense I grew up with. That's what I'm saying to you. And so one night when I was 12 years old, I was standing at the front of the church, and everybody was praying, and all kinds of interesting things were happening. And I said, Lord, I want the Holy Ghost. And then it hit me. You mean I should ask? That is basic. So I said, I asked for the Holy Ghost. Now... I've been waiting 12 years. I was 12, you understand? So I said, I am going to speak in tongues now. Who taught you to say that? Nobody but the Holy Ghost. I said, I'm going to speak in tongues now. And if that's not right, stop me. okay, that's been 65 years ago and he hasn't stopped me yet. So either I got it or he's very slow. I got the Holy Ghost. That's what I'm saying to you. 
I stepped into prophecy the same way. I've told you the story about the first time that I interpreted a tongue. I've told a lot of these things. But you see, there's so many people, they don't know even the most basic things about the Holy Ghost, about the gifts of the Spirit, about speaking in tongues. And because they don't, some of them spoke in tongues whenever they received the Holy Ghost, and they've not spoken in tongues since. We've had people walk in this church and after the service tell me, this is the first time I've spoken in tongues in church in 30 years. I never ask them where they go to church. I don't want to know. Why don't you want to know? I can't afford to cop an attitude. Hello? I will allow no critical spirit on the inside of me. I'm not a person of guile. I'm not going to be attacking anybody. I'm just saying that there's a reality out there, and that reality is not so great sometimes. So, what do you do if you don't know? What do you do if you've not been taught? What do you do if you don't realize that you can do these things? Well, okay, this is deeply theological. Just give her a try. How's that? But God might strike me dead. I'm still alive. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. How many of you know how to swim? Raise your hand. I heard somebody say kind of. I'll put myself in the kind of group. You know how a lot of people learn to swim? Somebody throws them in. I'm going to change the title of this sermon today to throw them in. Because sometimes that's what needs to happen. But you see, because of what people were taught or what they were not taught, these same people, they may not realize, careful now, that they received the spiritual gift of prophecy when they received the Holy Ghost. Boy, is that heresy in Tulsa. I think I've got your attention. What I'm actually describing is where a lot of people are today. I'm just getting started. But you see, you take the people that I've been talking about, and then on the other hand, the person who knows they have received the spiritual gift of prophecy, whatever they might think that is, however they believe that they received it, whether they know what they should do with it or not or when they should do it, that person, just by believing they have received the spiritual gift of prophecy, they're going to be on a different level to these people that have not been taught any of these things and they don't even think it's be, abave, be available to them. Can you see that? That's going to be very, very different. Now, it doesn't mean that this person who says, well, I've received the gift of prophecy, it doesn't mean that they're always going to get it right, that they're going to do things just exactly right or at the right time or something else like that. It doesn't mean that at all. But just that confidence that is in them, I have the spiritual gift of prophecy. That is going to put them on a different level to the person who says, well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I could ever get that. I'm not sure I could ever have that. Now, I'm trying to break the ice here, so help me out. Say this out loud. I have access to every one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. I heard a Baptist pastor say that on TV. After inviting his congregation, this was their fourth service that they showed on TV. That's what they said. 
And he invited people in that big Baptist church to come forward to receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and the front of the church was jam-packed. And he told them, now I'm going to pray for you in a moment. And whenever I pray for you, you will receive the Holy Ghost. And after you receive the Holy Ghost, then you open your mouth and you expect to speak in tongues. This is in a big Baptist church. I saw it on TV. And he said, but I also want you to know that along with speaking in tongues, you're going to receive all nine gifts of the Spirit tonight. And a lot of churches that have been Pentecostal churches for years, I tell you, if they watch that, they'd gag. They'd just choke. I couldn't sit still. I was shouting glory to God, hallelujah, somebody's got it. Somebody else saw this. Somebody else has got the guts to stand up and say it. Amen. Now let's take this a step further. Because I've been telling you there's one gift of prophecy. You're going to see it on different levels. You're going to see it operate differently in different people. But it's all the same Holy Ghost. And it's all the same gift of prophecy. Now all of you know there is a spiritual gift called divers kinds of tongues. Okay? Now that is not scuba diving and deep sea diving and you know, no, no, no. It's different kinds of tongues. Okay? That's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. But have you ever noticed there is no mention of divers kinds of prophecy? There's not. Because there's only one kind of prophecy. There's only one gift of prophecy. I believe all prophecy comes from the same fountain of this gift of the Spirit. This is why I chose to approach this on terms of different levels of prophecy. Now, what I'm in the process of doing today is I'm combining those first two that you saw on the screen a while ago. Those people from 1 Corinthians 14 and the spiritual gift of prophecy. Now, that might raise a question. Why do I think these two different levels of prophecy exist? If I'm going to combine them, why did I start out there? Well, just to get people to hook up with me and what I'm saying, first of all. But I'm going to use the rest of this message to answer those questions. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul indicated very strongly, I might add, that every spirit-filled believer could prophesy. And I'm basing that on his strong desire for all of these tongue-talking, spirit-filled, this whole group of people in Corinth to prophesy. Let me read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting at verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Stop right there for a moment. Now, how mean would it be? How cruel would it be for Paul to say, I want you to especially desire to prophesy, but you probably won't. You may not. Because you see, I want all of you on this front row to desire to prophesy, but you will, and you won't, and you might. Probably not you. <laughs> That's the way we've treated this. And they're sitting here saying, what about us? Well, I'm going to talk to you. Y'all figure it out. That's kind of what we've had, is it not? That's a shame, folks. That's a shame. If I didn't have any verse but this, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And there's a period right there. And if that's all I had, I'd say, okay, I'm going to desire to prophesy. And I'm going to desire to prophesy until I prophesy. And then I'm going to keep desiring so I can prophesy some more. 
Why wouldn't you do that? Well, he goes on to explain. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Every spirit-filled believer should speak in tongues on a regular basis and prophesy. Now, if that's true, and I'm totally convinced it's true, but if it's really true, why why aren't there more people saying it? Why have there been more people saying it? Why, Why isn't there more said about, why isn't it encouraged? I'll tell you exactly why it is not encouraged, has not been encouraged. It's because of men and women of God in the pulpit that were afraid it would happen. And in their little hearts, they were thinking, I don't know what in the world I would do if I found out that half my congregation was prophesying to one another. Well, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd say, do it some more. Go for it. Oh, but what what if they mess up? No big deal. I'd rather them do that and get in sin. Hello? I mean, the years I've been in the ministry, I've had to clean up all kinds of stuff. I've had to deal with every kind of mess you can imagine. People just get their lives in turmoil, all goofed up and everything else. I can't imagine that somebody prophesying to somebody in the church that I pastor is worse than some of the junk I've had to deal with. (laughs) You know, I'd say, okay, let's just sit down and talk about it a little bit here. We'll fix this, and then you can do better next time. And, And you don't get mad the next time somebody prophesies to you. Hello? Oh, man, everybody here starts prophesying. What are you going to do, Pastor? I'm going to shout. You mean you really want that? Well, is this a New Testament church or is it not? Is this a Holy Ghost church or is it not? See, I have compared 1 Corinthians 14 with Acts 19. Look at Acts 19, 6. It says, when Paul had laid his hands on them... The Holy Ghost came on them. This is 12 men. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. They spake with tongues and prophesied. I need to ask a question. How many of you, when you first received the Holy Ghost, you spoke in tongues and you prophesied? Raise your hand. One, two, three, You mean we can't get 12? (laughs) Paul got 12. At one time. Why? Why don't we see more of this? Let me tell you something about the Word of God. If there's things in the Word of God that you want to see more of, then talk about it more. I said if there's things in the Word of God you want to see more of, then talk about it more. If they're singing the word of God you want to see more of, then meditate on it more. Pray about it more. Talk to the Lord about it more. Let the Holy Ghost talk to you about it more, and then you talk about it more, and you'll see those things more. But see, we haven't talked about this. We've acted like, well, okay, that happened to those 12 guys, but it was only those 12 guys, and that's the only time, and that's it. Well, I got three folks here that say otherwise, and one of them's Rex, and he's the drummer. And he prophesied and spoke in tongues when he received the Holy Ghost. It's why he's so good at playing the drums. <laughs> I don't know that that's the case, but anyway. These 12 men received the Holy Ghost. And these 12 men were actually doing what Paul was wanting to see the believers in Corinth do. But they were doing it. 
The view that many people have of the day of Pentecost is a major reason that we don't see the things happening today as the Bible talks about them the way we should. And it's because of this view of the day of Pentecost. We have placed most of the emphasis of what happened on the day of Pentecost on the matter of speaking in tongues. Obviously, I'm not saying that is wrong and simply stating a fact because there's not many churches that I know anything about that start their service week after week after week, year after year after year by having everybody speak in tongues. So obviously, I don't have a problem with speaking in tongues. I don't even have a problem putting emphasis on that. But it's what has resulted that bothers me. How many of you have ever heard of P.C. Nelson? Okay, good, good. I just didn't know because I've never mentioned it. Peter Christopher Nelson. He was born in 1868 and died in 1942. He was a Baptist evangelist and writer. He was born in Denmark. He was reported to be able to read 25 different languages. Now, I'll connect him to the Bible college that I went to in just a moment, but I was told at Bible college he was fluent in seven of those languages. He could read them, he could write them, speak them. He was fluent in seven of those 25 languages. Now, after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, then Nelson became an evangelist with the Assemblies of God and later was one of the founders of what is now Southwestern Assemblies of God University in Waxahachie, Texas. And that is where I went to Bible college. The campus at Southwestern is dedicated to P.C. Nelson. It's the P.C. Nelson Memorial Library. Now, why did I tell you all that? Well, I was told that P.C. Nelson said one time, if we ever stop emphasizing speaking in tongues, the Holy Ghost will cease to be a part of our church services. Well, guess what? He turned out to be right. Because there are hundreds of churches where nobody ever speaks in tongues and the Holy Ghost is not a part of those church services. But you see, it's this emphasis. That's why I went with this. This strong emphasis that's been put on speaking in tongues, but only on speaking in tongues. It's that that I think has gotten things off balance. Now, the Assemblies of God have what they call their 16 fundamental truths. I used to have these things memorized because I had to, to be ordained as an Assemblies of God minister. But that's a long time ago, and so I don't have them memorized anymore. So I looked them up. That's their official doctrinal statement. And they say, listen carefully, the baptism of believers in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance. Now, I agree with that statement, but I also think many people have missed the significance of one very, very important word, and that word is initial. Initial means the first, or something that occurs at the beginning. So we begin with this experience in the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is the first physical sign. Say this out loud. The first physical sign. Say it again. The first physical sign. Now, that tells you because we stuck the word First in there, or somebody did. I didn't write that. But because there is a first, and it's labeled a first 
physical sign, that means there is a second physical sign. Why would you say it's the first one if there's not a second one? You're wanting me to tell you what the second one is. I don't know at the moment. I want you to think about it, because in a moment I'll know. I want to go a little bit further. The first physical sign. Hmm. Well, since they said physical signs, there must be signs that are not physical. How about that? And since they said there's the first physical sign oh I read one time that there's supposed to be something called signs following signs and wonders and so you obviously believe in signs because you got the first physical one Now, what do you think the second one is? Tell me. Talk to me. Healing. What? Healing. Healing? Wonders. Wonders? Just throw out anything that comes to you. Miracles. What? Miracles? Miracles? Power? Power? Interpretation? Interpretation? Supernatural? Some of my friends say this, and some of my friends say this, and so I'm from my friend, so I'll just accept all of it. But frankly, I think it was prophecy. They spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. They spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Prophecy. Oh, but that's spiritual. Yeah, but you got to use a natural mouth to do it. You got to use a physical mouth to do it. You got to use physical vocal cords to do it. So that's the one I'm going to vote for, except we're not voting. I'm just trying to stir you up as much as I can. But you see, this is where we begin. This is where we start. This is the first physical sign. But we never stop speaking in tongues. Just because it was first, that doesn't mean, okay, we're done with that. Now we go on to the second one. No, 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 no. We keep going with this. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues in the upper room, and they kept speaking in tongues. As you can see in other places in the book of Acts, but the Holy Ghost quickly added to that on the day of Pentecost. So we should be expecting more. Say this out loud. On The day of Pentecost, those 120 approximately people were prophesying. No way to base that on. Well, when Peter gave his explanation of what was happening that day, Peter quoted Joel. Most of you read that over and over and over and over again. Joel said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He is explaining what is happening that day. And he says, quoting Joel, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He went on to say, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Talk about your sons, your daughters, the handmaid. All sorts of people are listed there. God was pouring out his spirit, and in so doing, he was pouring the foundation for something that has never, never stopped. Now, here is an eye-opener. Joel never said anything about speaking in tongues when the Holy Ghost is poured out. Peter never mentioned speaking in tongues in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. You do realize Peter had another option. He chose Joel. This is that which was spoken 
by the prophet Joel, bum, 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 shall prophesy. He could have said, this is what's going on. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And quoted that. They shall speak with new tongues. But Peter didn't do that. He went straight to Joel. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. Right? Okay. Now let's just work on this just a little bit here. If Peter didn't say anything about that, if Joel didn't say anything about that, well, that does not say anything negative about speaking in tongues, does it? Just because they didn't mention it. We talk about the day of Pentecost, we talk about people getting drunk. Why do we talk about people getting drunk, but we don't talk about people prophesying? Peter talked about the prophesying. We talk about them getting drunk. Peter, Peter talked about them prophesying. We talk about them speaking in tongues. And Peter's got this explanation of God pouring out his spirit. Now, I am by no means downgrading the significance and the importance of tongues. But Peter never mentioned it, and I am going with that, and I am stressing the importance of prophesying. And by quoting from Joel, Peter labeled a lot of what these people were doing as prophesying. Say this out loud. I can prophesy using a language I do not know. What's that based on? They did it on the day of Pentecost. Well, how about prophesying using a language you do know. Why would rather prophesy using a language I don't know, and then that way I don't know if I goofed it up. (laughs) Well, I guess you got a point. But you see, if you prophesy in a language you don't know, then either the person hearing you has to know that language, or there has to be an interpretation for it to have any meaning. Otherwise, it has no meaning to them. Now think about that day. These Jews had come from nations all over the world, the Bible says, to be in Jerusalem. They're there, and they heard 120 people speaking their native languages, and they understood them. And this is their report. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now think back to that scripture I quoted a while ago. He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. These Jews had gone for years hearing nothing edifying at the temple and in the synagogue. God hadn't spoken in hundreds of years when the day of Pentecost got. This is why they were so shocked at the ministry of Jesus and all the things that he was saying. He was saying that he was the son of God. This is why there was such an uproar Heaven had been silent until Jesus was born, and the Holy Ghost had not been in the temple in hundreds of years. So to hear 120 people speaking in your native language, and they were talking about the wonderful works of God, wow, how awesome that must have been. That must have brought great edification, exhortation, and comfort to the hearts of those people. Because I'll tell you, when Peter preached and he gave them an opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus and to receive the Holy Ghost, immediately 3,000 of them gave their hearts to Jesus and received the Holy Ghost. 
That's the kind of stuff that happens when people are edified at church. Y'all are preaching real good today, so I'm going to keep you saying some things, okay? So repeat after me. The Holy Ghost does not have as one of its purposes beating people up. It is not the job of the Holy Ghost to browbeat people, to tell them how bad they are and how wrong they are. That's not the job of the Holy Ghost. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Wow. So on the day of Pentecost, the 120 were prophesying, as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul was saying to the people in Corinth, speaking in tongues in languages you don't know is good. Speaking in tongues 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 is good, good, but nobody understands you. So, we need more of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I'm telling you, that's what Paul was saying, that's what I'm saying. We need more of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Now, what would you do if you had a church full of drunks? As long as they're drunk in the Holy Ghost, we just have a party. Just have a ball. I'm all in. Come on. I've been at this my whole life. I'm, I'm not backing up now. I want everything the Holy Ghost is and everything he does. And I want to hear everything he's got to say. Amen. Oh, but what are you going to do if people come up to you, Pastor? People in your church, what are you going to do if they come up to you and they start prophesying to you? They already are. It happens more frequently than you would, than you would ever think, probably. Well, what do you think about it? Come on, bring it on. I think this is okay. I'm going to say it anyway. Because some of you did the same thing that I'm about to say. I sat in Kenneth Hagin's meetings over and 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 over over again. And he'd have a word for this one. He'd say something to this one. He'd prophesy to that one. And I'd sit there and say, I'm next. Me, come on, say something to me. You know what? He never did. That's right. He never did. None of those guys. Ed Dufresne prophesied to us. Isn't that right? And, and not many other folks have. Happy Caldwell. Yeah. So somebody comes up and say, Pastor, I got something the Lord told me to give you. I'm all ears. Oh, but what if it's just a big mess? I'll know it. Well, I'm not going to approach you because you would know. It's time to lay that stuff aside, folks. It really is. It really is. I'm serious about this. You see, you can use the language you know, careful now, and it can be the same language that people around you know, and with prophecy, you can say what you would have said in tongues and interpretation. Now, that throws a lot of people. I know that. I know that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm tossing it out there in big chunks today. I know that too, big chunks for some of you. But I'm very comfortable with this because for over 50 years, I have spoken in tongues and interpreted 
right in the middle of my messages, and sometimes I have done it over and over repeatedly in my messages, and some guy walked up to me one time in a message, in, in a service, at, not here, but in a, in a big meeting, and he said, you know, you shouldn't do that. And so I did it again. <laughs> because you should do that. And sometimes I don't give the tongue and the interpretation. I just prophesy it. This precious lady stood up and gave a tongue earlier in this service today. Do you know what? Without her giving that tongue, I could have prophesied verbatim the interpretation that I gave to that tongue that she gave. And I'll tell you, 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, I can. I just am not willing to say 100% of the time because I think that's stretching it because I don't like the word always when it comes to spiritual things unless the word says it's always. Are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. Are you? Well, how in the world can you, how can you prophesy what you would have said in tongues interpretation? Are they the same thing? No, they're not the same thing. We got a lot to talk about here. A lot to talk about. But you see, here's what I want you to get out of this. Paul said to them, neither you nor anyone else is interpreting what you're saying in tongues. So use your native language so that everyone understands. Tell the people what God is saying to you and through you, or that is prophesy. They were yielding to that prompting to give the tongue and then waiting, and nobody was interpreting it, and they were not interpreting it. And Paul was said, I wish you'd prophesy. Why? Because the same message from the Holy Ghost could come forth in prophecy that was coming forth in tongues and interpretation of tongues. Now, I took 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 6 through 15, and just so you understand, I shortened it a lot. I took out all the illustrations that are in there, and, and I just stuck in a few words to help make it real clear. That's all I did. And so I'm going to read it to you now. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting at verse 6. And we skip a lot here because we're leaving out those illustrations. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I interpret? If I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I interpret? That is, speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. I'll talk about that some more in a moment. Unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, that'd be interpretation of prophecy. How will it be known what is spoken? Since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel, which would be using a language people know. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. Pray the interpretation. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Sing the interpretation. Now, if you thought that when you speak in tongues, if you want the interpretation, you got to pray for the interpretation every time you got the wrong idea. If you'll listen, if you'll listen, if you'll listen, if you'll listen to the Holy Ghost, you can do it over and over and over and over. Why can you say that? How can you say that? Well, he said, pray that you might interpret. And then he goes right into this conclusion. Pray the Spirit. Pray with the understanding. Sing with the Spirit. Sing with the understanding. Clearly, clearly, 
making it obvious that this should be an ongoing process in our lives. Now, I'll admit, when I heard Oral Roberts say that whenever you pray in the Spirit, you can interpret your own tongue, my Assemblies of God theology had a fit. I'd never heard that before. And it was in the Bible. It's amazing what is in that book. It really is. And my wording that I put in there, it's in harmony with the context of these verses. But look at verse 8 once again. Look at it. Tongues and interpretation can bring revelation. Tongues and interpretation can bring knowledge. Tongues and interpretation can bring prophecy. Tongues and interpretation can bring teaching. This is why I've said some of the things that I have in this message so far. Yes, you could prophesy with tongues and interpretation. That's what I was explaining a while ago. Because what you gave in tongues and interpretation, you could say in prophecy. So prophecy can come through tongues and interpretation. Does that make sense to you? It's pretty logical. Ought to be pretty clear. But how do I know you can do that? Because that verse says so. These two gifts can bring revelation. They can bring knowledge. Many, many times in the middle of a message, I've given a tongue. I've given an interpretation. And what I gave was a revelation of something that was absolutely not in the notes. I didn't get it. I didn't know it. I didn't have it until that moment that I gave that tongue. I gave that interpretation. And that revelation came right then. I get taught while I'm teaching. I stand here and the Holy Ghost teaches me. And it happens Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And that's what ought to happen. That's the way it ought to be. But the very fact that these things listed here, revelation, knowledge, prophecy, and teaching, can come through tongues and interpretation, this is why we have these two gifts in addition to prophecy. Keep it simple for right now. I'll make it a lot more involved later on, but just equate prophecy to edification, exhortation, and comfort, but equate tongue, equate tongue interpretation to these four things listed here. There you can see a major difference in these gifts. But you see, most spirit-filled people who speak in tongues don't believe God will use them in that way. But he wants to, and he will. We have been leery of prophesying in a language we know. We have had the tendency to shut it down. Look out now. We have left the prophesying to the prophets. Because in many cases, we were told to. It's true. It's true. But Paul was talking to all the believers when he wrote those first few verses of 1 Corinthians 14. Now, I'm going, I'm headed this way. I haven't quite done this yet. I've taught a lot about the Holy Ghost, about the gifts of the Spirit. But where I'm headed is I'm going to take each one of the nine gifts eventually, and I'm going to talk about each one of them in detail. And I'll give you examples from the Bible. I'll give you examples from my life, from the lives of others. You'll understand all nine of them when I get through. Because you see, the nine gifts of the Spirit are not rare. They are not scarce. Those nine gifts are lying dormant in millions of spirit-filled believers. They are there and they are dormant. And it's true right here in America. It's true right here in Tulsa. It's true all over the world. And it is time to put them to use. It's time to release those gifts. Miracles and signs and wonders and healings are just waiting to be released when believers begin to do what Jesus told us to do. The Holy Ghost is determined to bring the full force of His power and the full manifestation of the glory of God to this earth, and I'm telling you, He is going to do it. He will not be stopped. He will never give up. 
You might as well get ready because it is coming because what the Holy Ghost does may blow right past a whole lot of people who speak in tongues and claim they're spirit-filled. Why can you be so bold about that and say it's coming? I'll tell you, this is exactly why. Because compassion demands action. Compassion demands action. And God, by His Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit lives on earth. Hello? I said the Holy Ghost lives on earth. Think about it. God the Father has a throne. Jesus has a throne. The Bible never mentions the Holy Ghost having a throne. You know why? Because he lives in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he knows all the junk that's going on around you. And he has great compassion on the people of this world that are hurting, 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 hurting. And that compassion demands action. And the Holy Ghost is looking for those who will allow him to work through them to do something about the hurting. Not all demonstrations and manifest manifestations of these gifts are as dramatic as they've often been portrayed. They're just not. Many of them are so low-key, you could miss them if you didn't know what was going on. It's true. As I said last week, most of you had those moments when you knew in your heart you had some comforting, edifying word you were supposed to give to some person. There was a little bit of exhortation there. Just believe it. Just act on it. Just do what the Lord's saying to you to do. You had that. But didn't do anything with it. It's happened again and again and again and again and again. You might have been waiting for some special, unique goosebumps or something. Some kind of feeling. The gifts of the Spirit do not function based on a feeling. They operate by faith. Well, then how do you know it's the gift of prophecy. How do you know when you're supposed to prophesy? Right, this is where 1 Corinthians 14 breaks into two sections. Because that first part was talking about you, wherever you are. And then that last section is about how it works in the church. And I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm going to talk about you at Walmart, at Target, at Reesers. At Quick Trip, that's what I'm going to talk about right now. And you're there buying your Diet Coke or whatever it is that you drink, iced tea or coffee or probably none of you drink Red Bull. So, But whatever it is, you're there. All of a sudden, something's happening on the inside of you. You look at this person, and they're just six feet away. And there's something going on in here. And you get what you're going to buy, and you turn around, you walk out, and you get a car, and you drive off. Did what you received go away, or did it just stay there? Six hours later, that's still going through your thoughts again and again and again. Even after you've gone home, just to make this as real as I can, more than once, I've gotten in my car and driven back to where I got that to see if that person was still there. Why? Because I realized the Holy Ghost had given me something and I didn't do anything with it. Yes, I've done that. Yes, I have. 
Because you see, when that comes, and it just doesn't leave, it doesn't go away. And you know you need to say something to a person, and you just could not get that. I'm going to use this word. You just could not get that out of your mind. Well, then follow through. Because this will grow with use. And just keep this in mind in the process. It doesn't take much kindness or gentleness to encourage a person who is hurting. It really doesn't. It doesn't take a whole lot. Don't think you need to know all the details about that person. Probably better if you don't. And don't add to what the Holy Ghost gives to you. Say this out loud. Embellishment, Embellishment. Distracts. distracts. See, simply don't do it. Resist that temptation. What the Holy Ghost wants to be said is enough. What you say does not have to sound polished. You don't even have to say, thus saith the Lord. You don't have to say, God told me to tell you this. You don't have to say any of that. Oh, but I want to give honor to God. Just by you very carefully, gently doing it, you're giving honor to God. You are honoring the Holy Ghost just by speaking the six words that he gave you to say to somebody. So you can leave off the spiritual lingo. You really can. Probably better off if you do. Just say what keeps coming up on the inside of you. And then when that stops, you stop. And what I'm talking about is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. It is the gift of prophecy. I love rumors. You didn't expect me to say that, did you? Not at all. The right kind, you understand. I can hear it now. A rumor going all over the place. Dr. Stewart thinks everybody in his church has the gift of prophecy. Start that rumor. That's what I mean. Oh, the old man, he's lost it. No, I haven't. I found it. I said, I found it. I know what I'm talking about. Come on. You, you mean you think everybody in here has got the gift of prophecy? Well, yeah. Yeah. See, my view of the gift of prophecy is very, very broad. There's people that will disagree because they have a very, very narrow and very restricted view of the gift of prophecy. Am I saying you received one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, the gift of prophecy, when you received the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues? I believe you got all nine of them. One, two, three. I think it was seven people agreed with me on that one. I'm just trying to help you use one of them. Actually, three of them. So here we go. Let's go with this a little bit more. In the verses that I shared with you today, we've been talking about three of the nine gifts of the Spirit. Use those three and see what happens. How can I tell if it's the Holy Ghost and not just me? I'm almost done. When I was at Southwestern, in the boys' dorm, we had a big prayer room up right off of the lobby. And guys would go up there and they would pray all night. Pray about their ministry. Pray about what the Lord wanted them to do. At least they said they did. So I decided to check it out. So I went up there. And I don't know, maybe some of them had prayed all night. But the guys that were in there the night I went in there were asleep. So... I thought, you know, if I stay here long enough, I'm going to fall asleep. And 
Jesus would just as soon me sleep in my bed as laying here on this floor. So I'm going to say what I got to say and go back to my room. But anyway, it was there. And so because of all the influences in my life that I talk about quite a bit, I didn't know whether I was really called to preach or not. Because just about everybody in my dorm wing, they'd done something horrible. They'd been in jail. You know, they'd shot somebody. They'd robbed a store. You know, they were alcoholics. They'd, they'd been hooked on drugs. I know, because they told me their stories, you know. You know, whenever God delivered me from alcohol and drugs and, you know, blah, 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 he called me into the ministry. And that's how I know I'm called, man. I never would have thought about doing anything like this. This was the kind of stories. And I'm standing there thinking, hmm. They'd ask me, what's your testimony? Well, I was saved when I was four, and there's not much more. I mean, I don't have any of them stories to tell, you know. So I'm trying to figure out if I'm called to the ministry. So I go to the prayer room, and I pray, and I pray, and I pray. And I finally hushed. You know, sometimes the Lord can't speak to us because we won't shut up. We just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. And that's what I was doing. I finally just, I guess, wore myself out. Just stopped. And I heard the Lord say, you love people, don't you? I said, yes, I do. He said, you really want to help people, don't you? I said, yes, I do. He said, and you think you're that good? You think that's your idea? You think you came up with that on your own? Who do you think put that love in you and that desire to help people? I got up, <clears throat> said, I ain't that good, but I got it. <laughs> this didn't start with me, and I've never questioned it since. In other words, what came to you, this prophecy thing, was it spontaneous? Did these words rise up on the inside of you? You were not even thinking this way a few minutes before you got these words to say? Those are all clues, folks. Let me give you another side to it. Or, or was it like this? How long did you sit and think about it before you got all the words exactly organized and you came up with exactly what you were going to say whenever you ran into that person the next time at Quick Trip you had it all prepared. Mark that one off. That's not prophecy. That's you. Did you hear something on the inside? Say this out loud. I'm almost through. Just say this out loud. The Holy Ghost lives in me and he talks. He talks on the inside of you. Where do you think these ideas to say something to somebody came from? It's that, pardon me, Holy Ghost, don't be offended. I don't think you will. It's that guy on the inside of you. It's him. It's him saying, see that person? Go tell them. Go tell them that I've got it that I've got it taken care of, that I know what's going on. Go tell them that it's going to be okay. What's going to be okay? I ain't going to tell you. You go tell them it's going to be okay. Are you getting this? You mean it's that simple? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, oh but Brother Hagin used to say, now, in, in 1999, it's going to be fine and you know how he'd prophesy and he'd rhyme? And, you know, we, we won't do that, see. And in 2020, it's, you know, we'd like to be able to do that. And all the whole ghost said to me is, go tell that guy over there. He looks like he's living on the street. Go tell him that I said that I love him and I care about him and, and I'm going to fix it. And he's going to get his family back together. Well, that don't rhyme. 
See how people get hung up on this? Does, you know, whenever you sit and think about this, you get in your, your little thing all together, you're going to say, well, does anything you finally came up with have anything to do with what you've got, what you started out with? See, you can mess around with this so much that it stops being the Holy Ghost and it becomes you. One more thing. If you do what I'm urging you to do, sometimes people will disagree with you. They'll look at you and say, what? What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. That don't make any sense. Or something worse than that. If that happens to you, don't get in strife. And don't argue. If somebody thinks you were wrong or you're nuts or whatever, you missed it, just very kindly and gently say, okay, that's, that's what I got. I was supposed to say that to you. I'll just leave that with you and the Lord. And then you just move on and keep walking in love toward them. See, a whole lot about operating in the gift of prophecy is attitude, 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 attitude. Be kind, be gentle, be loving. Let the Holy Ghost speak through you. Amen. Amen. Done. Next week, what makes the ministry gift of the prophet different to all these things I've said today? We're going to receive our offering at this time. If you need an offering envelope, please lift your hand. The ushers will see that you get one.